Everything looks better with a dram in your hand. Only joking. Don't worry, I would never give you the silent treatment. Welcome to week four of the Cask 88 lock-in. My beard's a little longer, my hair's a little shaggier, but overall I'm feeling quite vigorous about the whole thing. That might be in part due to the fact that I'm constantly talking to fascinating people and extracting their secrets, but it may also be due to my whiskey fitness regime, which I'm sticking to every week. I'll share the secrets of that between our interviews today. But first, there's a story often told in the whiskey industry about that time in the mid 19th century when Scotch whiskey got its big break, but at a terrible cost to European wine. Now, like many stories, this one is a little oversimplified, but in today's world of global markets and unintended consequences, it still feels pretty relevant. Here's the standard narrative. In the early days, sailing ships took samples of New World vines back to Europe for experimentation. Unknown to them, they were also giving passage to millions of little stowaways, hiding in the roots and leaf galls of the vines. Tiny, sap-sucking, dry, climate-loving aphids that came to be called Phylloxera. These parasites were not good sailors, and they died in great numbers during the long voyage. Europe still had no idea of the disaster it was flirting with. Then came technology. In the 1860s, American vines were still being shipped across the ocean, but now it was the age of the steamship. Transatlantic voyages became shorter, short enough for Phylloxera to survive the journey and disembark in European ports. Now Phylloxera got their second name, the Statrix, the Destroyer. Wave after wave, the European vines succumbed as their naive and defenseless roots were vampirized by billions of little sucking mouthparts. Sacre bleu! Dios mio! Oh, mio Zeus! Ma cazzo, porca di quella puttana! Come minchia è possibile? Nearly every European wine growing region became infested and wine production fell off a cliff. And where there are no grapes to make wine, there are none to make brandy, nor cognac neither. Oh, hubristic humans, you think this planet was made just for your use? Luckily, Scotland kept their wits about them. Does anybody fancy a dram? Now that story is the received wisdom, and it's one of the many times that wine and whiskey have overlapped throughout their history. But how different or similar are the two disciplines really? I'm joined now by Andy Kelly, a man who took a very different fork in the road of life from me. Where I chose whiskey, he chose wine, and now knows an enormous amount about it. He shares that knowledge on his website, getyourcorkout.com. Andy Kelly, welcome. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much for having me on. Do you see a lot of overlap between modern whiskey drinkers and modern wine drinkers? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I think that a lot of the principles that, that you have when drinking whiskey and wine uh, are very similar. Uh, so for the sort of the intermediate wine drinker, they're probably going to know to choose specific glasses for specific wines. They're going to look at the colour of the wine inside the glass because that will generally give you a good indication of whether the wine is going to be of any quality. Um, you then are going to take in the aromas uh, on the nose and then of course you're going to take it onto the palate then you're going to sip it and see what the, the wine gives you on the palate. It's very much the same for whiskey. You're going to look at the colour and the glass of the whiskey. There's certain aromas that come with certain types of whiskey uh, from certain areas and then of course you're going to want to see what it gets uh, on the palate as well and my whiskey drinking friends in particular can appreciate um, certainly a good glass of wine because they use those principles that they've developed for their love of whiskey. So let's talk similarities and differences. Now, to a whiskey, the oak barrel aging is everything, but that's a bit more optional in wine. But what does oak aging give to a wine? For red wine, you're going to kind of get flavours of uh, vanilla, and from north, you're going to get uh, oak as well. With white wines, I think they actually give you more kind of flavours. You get flavours of cream. I think butter in particular, vanilla you're going to get as well. But you might also get brioche with that sort of aging aspect uh, of it. It also affects the body of the wine more for white wine. So the white wine will have a fuller body 
and um, the wines themselves will be much more golden in colour instead of the traditional pale lemon. It's interesting to hear, there's, there's so much I hear there that is uh, familiar to me, but those flavours of vanilla, the kind of leathery flavours, uh, we talk about that a lot in whiskey and it's, it's really nice to hear that wine is getting the same kind of thing. And when you talk about wine, terroir is a huge word which isn't mentioned quite so often in whiskey. There's a big debate as to whether terroir even really exists in whiskey. So what does terroir mean to wine? And is there something that we can transfer to whiskey from that? Yeah, so terroir to wine is basically the sense of place that you can define within the taste of the wine. To define terroir is, it's generally to do with the soil, the climate of the region, the microclimate of the region, the grapes that are actually used uh, within that region as well and also the winemaking process. It's also very important for cognac. Uh, there are six crus or, or terroir in, in cognac uh, in particular. You've got Petit Champagne uh, and Grand Champagne. They're generally seen as probably the, the highest quality and the soils uh, they have are predominantly chalk. You've then got sort of on the opposite end of the scale. It is called Bois Ordinaire. Now that is generally seen as perhaps the least favoured of all of the six terroir in cognac. Uh, and it's got, um, it's got kind of a, they say like a maritime kind of taste to it, it's very salty. Uh, whereas the Petit Champagne and Grand Champagne, you get more floral notes uh, as well. It, it seems like some of that could be applied to us in whiskey. So we're, what we're kind of saying is that grapes have a long memory and that even survives distillation because cognac is distilled grape juice in the way that we're doing distilled barley juice. And so we have our terroirs in Scotland. Um, if you're on the islands, you might expect some of those maritime notes you were talking about. If a whiskey matures somewhere near the sea, you might get a touch of saltiness to it. I'm comforted to know that people talk about terroir and cognac because that's actually quite close in its method of production to whiskey. So how do you feel about certain whiskey makers going to France and Spain and Italy, buying up some old wine casks, taking them home to Scotland and then putting their whiskey inside to get some of those flavours. For me in particular, um, I think it should be done. Cask is expensive and it can cost anywhere between five and fifteen hundred pounds for one wine barrel uh, in particular. Also, it takes one oak tree to produce two wine barrels as well. Everybody wins as far as I'm concerned. The winemaker will be able to recoup some of his money back. The distiller will get barrels that are a little bit cheaper. We often use the barrels for a few rounds of maturation sometimes, but it's that first fill after uh, the wine was in there that tends to be the most valuable. But yeah, they, they can have quite a long life uh, maturing whiskey. Each time you refill them, they will be a little milder. They won't have the same strong flavors, but that can be desirable as well. Now, wine has a really long relationship of being paired with food. In fact, it's really seen as the best thing to do with wine is to have it with a nice meal. Whiskey's starting to take its first steps. I think it's, it's even taken its first steps already, but people are getting more comfortable with drink, drinking uh, whiskey while they have food. Um, so why was it so successful for wine? Do you think it could also work for whiskey? When you're pairing wine with food, uh, what you want to do is that you want both the pleasurable experience from the wine and the pleasurable experience from the food to be combined together. I find it quite subjective. Uh, and I think there are only certain principles that you can take with wine and food pairing. Um, but I think you can apply those principles to, to whiskey pairing uh, with food as well. You want to kind of keep the flavour, intensity of the wine and the food very much the same. You don't really want one to overpower the other because that's just going to create a bit of a negative um, taste and experience for you. I think that um, my whiskey friends also talk a lot about sweetness in their whiskey. They, they like them to be quite sweet. So you could in theory pair a sweet whiskey with desserts i think that you know absolutely possible um light fragrant whiskies probably going to pair well with maybe salmon uh, and cream cheeses uh too so i think there are going to be some fantastic whiskey uh, and food pairings that, that uh, lay undiscovered i think a lot of people are going to jump on the bandwagon and, and rightly so anecdotally and actually i think referring back to what rachel mccormack said in our first episode if you've got a smoky whiskey Pair it with a really intense blue cheese. There's some real magic that happens between those two. Right, okay, interesting. I'll, I'll pass that on. I'll be definitely passing that on to my, uh, to my friends, definitely. This has been a lot of fun. Andy Kelly, if people want to see a bit more of your enthusiasm for wine, just head over to get your cork out and um, 
see what he has to say. Thank you very much for joining us today. Sam, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure and it's been grateful. When I was young, I saw that interview that Michael Parkinson did with Rod Hull and Emu. And ever since then, I've been consumed by the fear that I might get bitten by a felt puppet riding a man's hand. For this reason, it was the fearless Struan who embarked on our next interview. Please welcome my uh, guest today, who has basically been on the Britain's Got Talent final a few years ago and since then has not stopped. Touring all around the world, please welcome Steve Hewlett. Thank you very much. Hi, Stuart. And uh, uh, what a lovely introduction. But, um, I, oh, sorry, this is Arthur Lager. Oh, yeah, you forgot <laughs> I was here, didn't you? I forgot he was there. He's like a glove, you know, so it just fits uh, like, like a glove. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is Arthur Lager. Is that Stuart? Yeah. With this being now five weeks into lockdown, everyone's kind of having a habit of talking to themselves a wee bit. I've found it's increased a lot more for myself. So with obviously Arthur and several other characters on your, uh, on your hand and in your head, do you find you talk to yourself more in different voices? It's a natural thing, but I don't. I don't actually do it when the characters aren't here. Ooh, when you're not here, I, I don't talk to myself. But my wife does it more than I do. But I want to make sure. I mean, if they are talking to themselves, you've got to make sure their lips are not moving. That's the important key. Yeah, I'm still watching. <laughs> yeah, so it only happens when I talk, though, doesn't it? Yeah, yes, it does. See, he knows. Speaking of which, obviously we're talking about whiskey as a channel here. Um, with the uh, ageing of whiskey, the wood's the most important thing and what its life's been like. Where it comes to yourself, Arthur, do you find the different types of foam that you use really influences how you work? So, uh, I made out of foam. You made out of foam? Yeah. And then there'll be foam. Yeah, so any ladies on the, uh, you know, it's going to be the best night they've ever had. They'll never forget it. <laughs> no, I'm talking about. Mind you, they don't know whiskey. I'll forget it. You do? Yeah. Can't remember a thing. Speaking of which, like, are you much of a whiskey drinker yourself, Arthur? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I do like it. I like a little whiskey. I do. Yeah. Every time, uh, I, every time he drinks it, I get a bit dizzy. His hand goes like this. Yeah. I soak it up like a sponge. Speaking of which, obviously, when it comes to uh, drinking on the uh, on the job for yourself, does uh, do you find Arthur that Steve sort of has a wee tipple whilst you're on stage? When he has a tipple, he moves his lips. He can't control his legs or his lips. <laughs> now I don't like it when he drinks because he slurs my words. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like people knowing that he's. Um, uh, you know, all down to me. So, uh, you what? Nothing. You don't like hearing that either. <laughs> well, can't you? I've got cloth ears. <laughs> Done it again. And obviously, where it comes to uh, the famous ventriloquist trick of drinking water whilst Arthur would still be able to speak, for example, mm. is there equivalent you can do with whiskey by any chance? Oh, so I, I could try and do it with whiskey. I, I, it's, it's not going to be easy. But um, I now have in this, so since since the um, the lockdown, I, I've been having uh, lemon. You have a slice of lemon, a slice of ginger, fresh lemon and ginger. You put some cloves in there, and then you put two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, and then a spoonful of honey. And then, tilt in as much whiskey as you like. Okay, so it, it's just, it's for the immune system, really. But those ingredients are key. And uh, the whiskey, but I've not got whiskey in that because um, I'm homeschooling in a couple of minutes <laughs> after this. So uh, I, I'm going to have my whiskey separate, actually. So uh, you know what? I'm going to have it separately because I was, I was drinking it just before <laughs> we came on. You're joking? No. You had a laugh. Yeah. I wonder why I was moving about more than usual. I'm sorry. Hang on. Thought so? What? You can't talk when I drink. It's the other way around. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I shouldn't have had a drink, should I? <laughs> oh, get a little bit dizzy. <laughs> Hang on. Oh. oh, he's still gone again. Sorry. Oh, yeah. oh, hey. 
Uh, Stuart, you're gonna have to stop him drinking, mate. He can't handle it. He's a lightweight. Uh, he's gone again. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. <laughs> yeah, absolutely perfect. Hello. What's going on? I'm getting a bit dizzy. Your fingers are dizzy. My fingers are a little bit dizzy. I don't know where they are. Where are they in there? <laughs> Hello. Are you still there? I'm getting a bit dizzy. Hello. <laughs> Chucky's coming. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, speaking of which, is there uh, what other projects have you got in the lineup? Apart from writing the book, which we're editing now, uh, it's going to be a big bump of book on Ventura. Can I go now? Oh, I need the toilet. Stop drinking. He drinks and I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> there you go. Stop it. He's, uh, he's, he's in lockdown again, so. <laughs> uh, there? It's been an absolute blast on to you and Arthur formerly, now that he's gone. Uh, <laughs> is there any particular way that we can make sure to keep up with you once things calm down a bit and you're back to working on the stage? On our website, thestevehewlittshow.com, you can see all my dates or, or rescheduled dates. You know, all, all of this hopefully will start coming back, but everything's on my website. I've got a Facebook page. A YouTube channel. If you look at the Steve Hewlett show, you will see all my bits out there. And I'm, I'm constantly doing shows like this and saying hello to people now and again. I do Facebook lives. Everyone needs to be entertained, and we do need to laugh now and again. And so, uh, it, it, I think it is the best medicine. But we're not at the moment. We know what we need, but <laughs> it's uh, you know a bit of laughter doesn't hurt. Uh, well, Steve, thanks very much for your time today, and also cheers, Arthur. We'll see you later. Thank you, mate. Good night. See you later. He's around here somewhere. Thanks, buddy. Take care. You get the idea. Leith was once the beating heart of Edinburgh's whisky industry, but changing times and a reduction in shipping changed where power resided. These days, however, we're starting to see Leith awaken again and seek to regain its place as the urban heart of whisky. Glenmore Spirits is one of the Leith companies seeking to jumpstart this renaissance, and I'm joined by Greg Urquhart of Glenmore today. Greg, hello. Great to, great to have you with us. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Thanks for having me. To call Glenmore a whiskey company feels like it's not saying enough. Even saying a spirits company feels like we're really far short of the truth. How would you describe Glenmore yourself? Yeah, it's, as you say, it's not, it's not just whiskey that we're known for. We're quite experimental in terms of spirit in general. So um, we've got a bit of a history in gin, probably kicked off slightly before the gin boom kicked off. Uh, raised a few eyebrows in some cask aged gin. At the time, there wasn't many people doing it. And, and following on from that, we're uh, doing a bit more experimenting with whiskey, um, bringing blending back to Leith, coming up with some, some new kind of blended malt recipes and such like. So yeah, we've, we've got a few different uh, strings to our bow. Um, we're pretty well known for a rare find range, which is probably the, the jewel in the crown of our brands. It's, it's where we showcase hand-picked casts from all over Scotland, from distilleries. Um, and even in the past, we've, we've taken the Irish single cask whiskies, and we've done uh, Armagnacs and things like that as well. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot there that comes through our door. You're one of the kind of quite smaller companies, but that maybe gives you an advantage that you can move a bit quicker than some of the big boys when you want to do something a bit experimental or change something up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you say, sometimes the, the bigger a business gets, the more inflexible it gets. Um, and there's maybe more people to run things fast if you've got an idea about a particular uh, finish of a cask, for example. Sometimes it's someone just has a light bulb moment and, and then we just make it happen, we just try it out. Um, and also at the same time, we're learning all the time what kind of cask work with different spirits and, and different influences. So it's, it's, it's a really good environment for kind of uh, coming up with new things. Firkin Gin, there's loads of different gins in that range. And the ones you said that raised eyebrows were barrel aged, oat aged gins, taking a little bit out of whiskey's book there. How did that come about? We're, we're whiskey drinkers in the building, traditionally. We, we love what the effect that oak can have onto spirit. Um, it was before I started that the Birkin journey started, and that was um, Dirk and Karen, 
playing around. They put some some gin into a working cask um, to see what would happen. Left it for a few months, took it out, and lo and behold, they had a product that was actually uh, getting some really good kind of feedback. From it. It's nice to be able to get people to try and eat. The spirit itself uh, is forty six percent, very smooth. It becomes a very unique product. The first ba- the first ever maturation was in a firkin cask. We actually still have it. It's in the warehouse in Leith and it's on its final fill. But really at heart, firkin was all about cask maturation. Firkin now is, is re-establishing itself as being um, a, a great gin in its own right before it goes into cask and then on into the cask journey after that. Following the whiskey lines, I guess. Yes, absolutely. Being in Leith, you're in a place that, you know, a hundred years ago was established as you know, the place of the the whiskey barons, the blenders, people who are creatively bringing whiskies together. And that's a legacy that you've continued with your blended malt series, right? The blended malt series we've got, um, it's called Whiskey Row. We've got some here. So uh, this is our batch one. Um, there's three expressions. So we've got our, our smoke and peat, and they're all flavor driven. And we've got rich and spicy and uh, smooth and sweet. So they're, they're, they're all on batch one, as I say. Batch two will be different cask makeup, different um, sourcing from distant, different distilleries. But from batch to batch, it will be a, a different experience, and we hope that will become a point of interest. And then, of course, single casks. You have the um, the rare fine series, and this is all about just isolating something very singular from a single cask, and then showing that off. Went through a rebrand recently, so I've got that's our old branding there. The spirit's always been great. And the spirit is just as good now, but the branding's been pulled up to a bit more of a contemporary look, a bit more premium kind of uh, look to the bottle. So yeah, it's um, we're very proud of Rare Find um, as a brand. Now, another advantage, I guess, of uh, being small and quick to turn around is that when the when the COVID-19 thing came along, Glenmore were really quick to retool the production and start producing hand sanitizer for the uh, for the sort of medical front lines. Was that a, was that a difficult change to make? It ha- all happened so quick. And with the, the community and, and the drinks industries, there's so many people you can pull on and chat to. Other people were looking at it as well. Obviously, you can't just go making things without knowing you're doing it correctly. So we, we, we spoke to the relevant people and we were directed towards a recipe which was designed by the World Health Organization. So it's an approved recipe, which meant we could just source the relevant things we didn't have. The biggest challenge has actually been uh, the bottles, the actual containers themselves uh, to, to give out a finished product. That was the trickiest part. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a quick turnaround within a few days, really. Um, and it's been kind of non-stop. By the end of next week, we, we should be in and around the kind of 25,000 units that we've, we've handed out to kind of frontline staff and stuff. So it's been very worthwhile. and. When you see people's faces when they pick it up and how grateful they are, it really hits home the how, how important it was, that decision it was. And thinking of positives, any plans for the future? Yeah, we've always got plans. Yeah, um, we've always got plans. Yeah, we're looking, we're looking at um, our next outturn of bottlings in terms of rare find. We're, we're discussing that. We've got, uh, we've got virtual tastings uh, going on just now as well, which we're actually we're using the proceeds to put towards the sanitizer production. Um, just follow our social channels or um, Chris um, in my whiskey blog. I'll be putting out some more information on, on future tastings as well. And I've seen the lineup for the next tasting, and it's, it's some pretty special stuff. I can't blow the lid on it just yet, but um, a lot of kind of uh, whiskies that you would have on your bucket list, put that way. Well. It's really great to see the, you know, the sanitizers coming from Glenmore now, and then the fact that there's no chance you're going to run out of ideas anytime in the near future. So really oh, excited yeah. to see what's coming next. Yeah, keep an eye out. We'll, we'll always have something on the, on the horizon. Perfect. Well, Greg Urquhart, thank you very much indeed. It's been great. Thank you, Tom. Oh, and there it is. Another fine episode in the bag. Truly a workout for both mind and body. Now I hope in our accepted style you'll join me again after the credits as I do a little bit of a warm down and some classic stretches just to ease everything out of my system. And if you really want to go the whole way you can also join me in mixing up a special batch of isotonic recovery juice which includes sugar, salt, vanilla, single malt scotch whiskey, and pure water. OK, 
Okay. Nope, 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 nope. 